Okay, so we're gathered here in uh, interesting times. <laughs> um, but it was interesting times that we got to the moon, so maybe we can get to Mars in these interesting times, one way or another. Now, um, as everyone here knows, uh, for the past, well, 26 years, since I put out the, uh, published the Mars Direct Plan, I've been saying, look, we can get to Mars within about 10 years of program start, and we can do it with the kind of technology we have or which we can develop within those 10 years of, of the program, that this does not have to be a task for the next generation, um, although the next generation from 1990 has now arrived, um, the, um, but it, it is a task for us. It is not a task for, you know, Captain Picard, uh, but for people who are in the astronaut corps today. Um, and um, I laid out a plan, which I have uh, presented uh, many times at this and other conferences, uh, called Mars Direct, in which is laid out in great detail in my book, The Case for Mars, um, and which just very briefly, um, you know, you do it with two launches of a heavy lift launch vehicle. The first shoots to Mars, an Earth return vehicle with no one in it. It lands on Mars. It makes its return propellant out of the Martian atmosphere. And then, um, you know, perhaps using a heavy lift vehicle like this to, to send it to Mars. This could lift 120 tons to Earth orbit and therefore send around 40 tons to Mars. Um, Earth return vehicle gets fueled up on the Martian surface by reacting the Martian atmosphere, which is carbon dioxide, with a small amount of hydrogen you bring from Earth to produce a large supply of methane oxygen rocket propellant. And then, you know, using very uh, straightforward 19th century industrial chemistry. Um, and then at the next launch opportunity, we shoot the crew out to Mars in a Habitat spacecraft. This is comparable in size to, for instance, our Mars Desert Research Station or our Mars Arctic Research Station. In fact, it's exactly the same size. Um, uh, of course, the same people were involved in the design of both. Um, and in this case, but we are only putting a crew of four in it. In our desert station, we do have six. Um, and we could provide artificial gravity to the crew to avoid the deleterious effects of long duration exposure to zero gravity, which is the only significant uh, space flight health effect that we have seen. We have not observed any radiological casualties among astronauts or cosmonauts that have flown in space. We have observed deterioration of health due to zero gravity exposure. It can be readily avoided by providing artificial gravity. And then we would land the Habitat spacecraft in the vicinity of the Earth return vehicle that has been pre-landed on Mars. Um, we would use it as our base on the surface of Mars for a year and a half while we explore. At the end of that time, we get in the Earth return vehicle, we fly back to Earth, leaving the habitat behind on Mars. And so uh, after a while, if you kept going to the same place, you could build up a Martian base by just landing habitats in the vicinity of each other. Now. So that's the Mars Direct Plan, and which for many reasons uh, I believe uh, remains uh, the best plan to get humans to Mars in our time. It is simple, it is straightforward, it involves no on-orbit assembly, uh, not even any rendezvous, um, and it doesn't require advanced propulsion, and there really is nothing in it that um, we don't know how to do. I mean, yes, we have to land bigger payloads on Mars than we currently land. That requires developing uh, bigger parachutes. This is not exactly the Manhattan Project that we're talking about. Um, the, the, yes, and it does have to be done right because even routine engineering, if done wrong, can result in catastrophe if buildings or bridges fail or so on. Um, but there it is. But here we are. How do we get this program off the ground? Now, NASA right now says, 
Okay, well, first of all, the good news. They say humans to Mars is the goal of the American space program, and that's important. Uh, we have established the criteria. We have established the goal, okay? Um, and back when we started during the Clinton administration, uh, they did not even say their goal was to take humans beyond Earth orbit, uh, let alone that the goal should be Mars. Um, so they have established that. And for example, Hillary Clinton in her recent campaign statement said that her goal would be to further NASA's mission of getting humans to Mars. But they don't say when, and she doesn't say when, and her opponent doesn't even address the subject. Um, but the, the and, and this is a problem because NASA, while, for instance, they recently published a document entitled uh, Journey to Mars, in which they claimed that they were engaged in the Humans to Mars program, what they were actually doing was using the vision of Humans to Mars as a justification for a set of random activities and, and saying, well, this will be handy when we someday go to Mars, or that will be handy. Um, and, and that's like trying to say that you're going to build a house when all you're doing is a, randomly accumulating house parts without a plan, okay? Uh, and then if someone asks you what your plan is, you tell someone, let's compose a plan, but it must include all these parts, okay? You know, it, it, it's kind of like somebody wants to produce Macbeth and someone who's willing to give them a little money towards the production says, look, I want you to put a part in this, the starring part for my daughter, who is a mute ballerina. <laughs> so somehow you have to change the script a little bit to have a mute ballerina in the starring role of Macbeth. And the, um, okay, and so you have to distort the script a bit. Um, and, uh, and so the script gets very distorted because what you have, when you don't have a plan and a definite destination and a definite schedule, what you actually have is a whole bunch of constituencies each doing their own thing, attempting to justify it by the nominal goal, and then even worse, even worse than the waste of money involved in, in spending it on non-useful activities, when they insist that you adjust the plan to make their pet technology mission critical. And thus, for example, right now we have this thing, uh, you know, well, we'll be discussing it tonight, the asteroid retrieval mission, which is designed to give certain existing programs something to do, but which has nothing to do with sending humans to Mars. And then, but not only then do they give a mission for the electric propulsion community to do, to have electric propulsion do something, then they insist that the Mars mission must be adjusted to make electric propulsion a star of the mission. And in fact, it doesn't need to be, and it impairs the mission to insist that it is. Okay, so we need to have an actual commitment to send people to Mars to force planners to do it in a rational way. Um, and uh, actually, there's an interesting story that the historian, space historian Howard McCurdy tells of a meeting that took place at the Marshall Space Flight Center around 1963. And they were arguing, how are we going to implement Apollo? Now, at this time, the lunar orbit rendezvous plan, which had been put forth by Johnny Humboldt, was public. It was under discussion. There was a certain faction supporting it, but it had not yet prevailed. Okay, so all the other factions were there. There was a whole gang there that said, oh, before you go to the moon, we gotta build a space station. Gotta have a space station before you go to the moon. There was another faction that said, no, no, we don't need a space station. All we need is a super booster, the Saturn Nine. Okay, which will be twice as powerful as the Saturn V. It'll be the next generation beyond that, and then we can shoot everything we need to go to the moon and come back direct, no sweat. Then there was the other faction, the nuclear rocket people. Oh, look, we can do it with Saturn Vs and without a space station if only it had nuclear propulsion, which would cut the mass, uh, the launch mass in half for a given amount sent on translunar injection. And then there were the lunar orbit rendezvous people who said, no, you don't need any of that. All you got to do is you do the lunar orbit rendezvous, and by staging things in this way, we can cut the mass. We don't need on-orbit assembly. We don't need the Saturn IV. We don't need the nuclear rocket. And people said, oh, no, 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 you don't want to do that. There's a lunar orbit rendezvous. It's complicated. It's unproven. Things go wrong. You must simply have 
a nuclear rocket or a space station or a Saturn. Right. Okay, so they're arguing like this. And then finally somebody says, look, do we really want to go to the moon or don't we? And then there was 30 seconds of dead silence, and then someone said, it's got to be lunar orbit rendezvous. Because if we were going to do it in the decade, which was the imperative that Kennedy had put down, that was the only way. If you have all these other people say, you can't do your program until you do my program, okay, you never get to do the program that you're supposed to be doing. And that's what we have now. So there needs to be leadership. And what we have now is that the political class and the, the NASA political class has recognized that humans to Mars is the goal the public wants. Okay, So then they have to justify their activities in that light. But they're not yet willing to do it. Now, why not? Well, there are some that are afraid of the mission risk. But there are others who, and there are others who are simply want to defend the existing programs. They have various constituencies in different parts of NASA who they want to protect. Yes, we, and, and, and if, if all these separate groups are going to be funded, there will not be money for a Humans to Mars program, which doesn't use them. Um, and then there's the political class, which is deterred. That is the actual ruling uh, the presidents and congressmen and senators. Um, who, you know, they get the report on this, well, it's going to take 30 years and cost $400 billion. And they say, well, we're not interested because we're not going to be in office in 30 years, and so there's no political payoff for us. And I don't know where we're going to find $400 billion in view of our other priorities. Um, the, um, so it doesn't happen. But we do have some interesting developments. And of course, the most interesting um, is the development by the SpaceX company of a set of hardware um, which could um, enable humans to Mars. And this is real. And um, it's hard, and we've seen they just had a failure, but they're progressing. There's no doubt about it. They've shown they can develop hardware in one third the time and one tenth the cost that had become accepted in the mainline aerospace industry. And most recently, they've shown they can develop stuff that has never been developed in the aerospace industry, such as re a reusable first stage. Okay? And that they're going to put this together into a configuration called the Falcon Heavy, um, which will have three connected boosters as the first stage, which could all be recovered in principle, and the second stage not. Um, but that means they're recovering most of the rocket. And uh, greatly reducing the launch cost, and but not only that, also launch payloads in the class required for humans to Mars. Now, and then they also have their Dragon, which, by the way, is way over designed for re-entry from low Earth orbit. It is designed to take re-entry from trans-Earth trajectory coming back from Mars directly into the Earth's atmosphere. So they are developing very significant parts of the hardware set needed to do a human Mars mission. And, and they're trying to make each one of them pay for itself as they build this up. And as parts of the hardware set are developed, then the cost and risk, that is both mission risk and also schedule risk, of the Mars mission is rapidly reduced. You know, Obama did not want to do the Bush Moon program, and he put together this Augustine Commission to find out a reason why it couldn't be done. And they came back and said, well, to do a moon program, you'd need a heavy lift vehicle. It'll take 12 years to develop and cost $36 billion. Now, Musk went into the room and he said, I'll do it for you for $2.5 billion fixed price. They said, that's not helpful. Go away, Elon. But the, um, 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 but, but here it is. If he actually develops the Falcon Heavy, and it is scheduled to fly perhaps within months, um, then that argument against the Mars program will go away. It will not be possible to make that argument because the vehicle will be there. Okay? And, uh, and also, so both that cost and that schedule impediment will no longer be there. And similarly, as other parts of this. And then, of course, we have uh, Jeff Bezos, who is, is just announced that he's developing a launch vehicle, which is of a significantly different design, but similar capability to the Falcon Heavy. Um, 
Now, when I first found out about the Falcon Heavy development, which was, I don't know, about four years ago or so, um, I wrote, I, I, I said, how could I do a human Mars mission with this hardware? In other words, I'd prefer to do it the Mars direct way with a heavy lift vehicle capable of 120 tons to low Earth orbit. But what if I had a Falcon Heavy, which is only 53 tons to low Earth orbit, which is a lot better than the 20 tons to low Earth orbit that existing launch vehicles can do, but it's not 120 tons. Okay, how, how could you do it? How could you design it? So. There's a, a variant of the Mars Direct program, which uh, uh, mission design, which I called the Mars Semi-Direct, and it is discussed in here because that's the plan that I worked out with uh, Dave Weaver at JSC, which was a modification of Mars Direct, uh, which met a number of their concerns on mass limits, um, which was a three-launch mission plan instead of two. Um, one delivered a Mars ascent vehicle to the Martian surface, which would make propellant. Another delivered an Earth return vehicle into a highly elliptical Mars orbit with no one in it. And then finally, we send the crew to the surface in a HAB module, similar to the Mars direct HAB, lands near the Mars ascent vehicle, conducts exploration for a year and a half, then gets in the ascent vehicle, flies up to orbit, rendezvous with the ascent vehicle. So you have a mission critical uh, rendezvous on the return leg. That's the only rendezvous in the mission. And then you fly home. Um, so that relaxes mass constraints. And if you do it that way and you reduce the crew, OK, you know, there are people at NASA say, well, the ideal crew is seven, OK, or something. And I say, you got to look at the hardware set you have and think of what you can send. You know, when they do a robotic mission, uh, the first constraint on the mission is its potential mass that can be delivered to the Martian surface or Mars orbit. And they have to scale the mission that way, not just any old way. Um, and um, so if we have these vehicles, how could we do it? So first. Well, we would do it three launches per opportunity. First sends a HAB module to the surface, but with no one in it. The second sends an ascent vehicle to the Martian surface with no one in it, but with an in situ resource utilization uh, um, machine, uh, in this case, to make oxygen. And we're going to hear later today from Mike Hecht, who is building a uh, oxygen maker to be sent to Mars on the Mars 2020 rover. So this is exactly the sort of thing that could be used, uh, but also with either methane or kerosene to burn with that oxygen. The oxygen is 3 quarters of the propellant, so right there you're getting most of the benefit of ISRU. Uh, and then uh, an Earth return vehicle, which is parked in a highly elliptical Mars orbit. Highly elliptical is easier to get into and easier to get out of than a circular orbit. Okay. Then at the next launch window, three more rockets, similar payload elements. The only difference is, is this time, the HAB module that we sent to the Martian surface has a crew of two astronauts in it. I'd prefer four. But with this uh, more limited kind of booster, two is what you can do. So you do two. Um, two is what we did send to the surface of the moon. Um, the, uh, and, but they have with them now on the surface two HAB modules, one that was pre-landed and the one they land in. They also have two Mars ascent vehicles, the one that was pre-landed and is already fueled and one they land in. And there's also two return vehicles in Mars orbit. Okay, and then you just keep doing this. This is the mission architecture. And I've worked out the numbers on this. And by the way, I have a little pamphlet book which will be available here. It's also available as a Kindle book. It's cheaper as a Kindle book, but if you like a physical book, we have it. Mars Direct, and you'll notice there is a Falcon Heavy on the cover. Um, the, uh, okay, and uh, now a Dragon is a pretty small habitation module. I mean, it's fine for a few days to go to orbit or even a week, but for a six-month transit to Mars and a six-month transit back, uh, it is rather small, even for two people. 
Well, this can be remedied by having an inflatable extension like you see here. And if this is made of Kevlar, about six meters in diameter, and I don't know, about eight meters long or something, um, this, um, it only weighs a couple of hundred kilograms. Uh, so it doesn't add that much mass to the mission to create massive additional living space. All the active systems are in the Dragon. Okay. Uh, and, and we can also apply artificial gravity. Once again, the same trick. You have the trans-Mars injection stage that flew them to Mars. It's now a dead mass. We can tether off of it. Okay. And here you can see how this is done. Uh, how they pulled it out of the booster. Um, and then you spin that up, you create gravity. Um, now, one thing that is constantly being used as a justification for why we can't go to Mars, uh, somewhat in the spirit of a 10-year-old using a light snowfall as a justification for why he can't go to school, um, is the radiation threat. Uh, of going to Mars. Now, the fact of the matter is this. Okay, solar flares can be prevent, uh, protected against by using the provisions of the mission to create a solar flare storm shelter. Cosmic rays are too high energy for that, so you're going to get the cosmic ray dose. But the cosmic ray dose in interplanetary space is just a factor of two higher than what it is in low Earth orbit. The Earth's magnetic field cannot stop gigavolt cosmic rays. Okay, so the Earth blocks out half the sky. That block makes the cosmic ray dose half as great uh, as what it would be. But what it means, though, is that astronauts and cosmonauts who have said, spent significant amounts of time on the space station or the Mir have, in fact, gotten cosmic ray doses fully comparable to what they would have gotten to going on a human mission to Mars. And there have been no radiological uh, casualties observed, nor would you expect it, because if you have a group of around 10 people and they each have a 1% chance of getting cancer from radiation, which is what the dose is, um, then uh, the chances are no one will have been hit and no one has. So this is a dodge. We do not need um, a cure for radiation or ultra-fast spaceships or anything of the sort to go to Mars. Uh, and, and I've worked out the numbers. Uh, on the masses of the life support and so forth for a crew of two, and they do fall in the envelopes of um, a mission of this type with the, the, this sorts of hardware. So this could be done. Now, will the next president muster the, the courage to commit? Who knows? But it's going to be an easier sell. And it will get progressively easier sell as more and more of these hardware elements are developed that actually do fit into a Mars mission plan. And by, I mean, I don't know, by the way, you know, Musk is going to announce his Mars mission plan next week. And I don't know if this is the plan. I'm sure it'll be different than this. But nevertheless, this is an existence proof that with this sort of hardware, you can do it. If you want to double the masses and have a crew of four, you would do the three launches. Well, it'd be six launches, but three um, payloads going to Mars, each launched by two boosters, which do a simple mate and dock in low Earth orbit. One is launching the trans-Mars injection stage. The other launches everything else. They mate, they dock, and shoot it off. OK, so if you don't like these masses, we can double the mass margins of this mission by having each of these ships, as it were, be launched not by a single launch, but by a double launch. So it can be done, OK? It's being made more feasible. Um, if we drive forward the idea that it should be done, if we make it clear to the political class that this is possible, that this is desirable, that humans need to go to Mars for the science, for the challenge to motivate the society, and for the future of what it means for the future to transform humanity into a multi-planet species, um, then at a certain point it will happen. I mean, we're going into dangerous times um, in the 60s basically decided we'd go to the moon to astound the world with what free people could do. But once again, there are those who are challenging what we represent, okay, from various quarters. 
Um, and I think, once again, it's time to astound the world with what free people do and astound ourselves with what we can do. Thank you. Okay, so um, uh, we have time for a few questions. Uh, and by the way, we have coming into the room right now some people who I think are one of the Gemini Mars teams. Uh, we're going to have 10 of these teams here on Saturday from various parts of the world, from Japan, Poland, Russia, United States, Australia, United Kingdom. I'm sure I'm forgetting some. But they, 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 they each have a, a feasible plan for a two person Mars flyby mission that can be accomplished by 2024, by the end of the next president's second term. So here it is. These are 10 different existence proofs, 10 different demonstrations that this can be done. And this can be done clearly within the time in office of the next president. And that is, by, in fact, why we're having this conference in Washington, so that there'll be some Washington people here who pick up some of this and say, hey, you know, we could do this. Why don't we do something? Why don't we have a space program that's actually going somewhere? Okay, you know, if we're saying we're doing humans to Mars, let's, let's take the first step here. Let's take, do it in our time, as opposed to saying it'd be great if somebody did it someday. Okay, so anyway, thanks for showing up. I'll take a few questions. Sir. Well, uh, the Bigelow is an inflatable ham. This is what I'm talking about as a much lighter weight and simpler inflatable ham. This has all of its active systems in the Dragon, all the actual life support, everything. All this is is essentially a Kevlar balloon that expands, and it has some sewn into it, some decks, because this is a gravity habitat. A Bigelow, of course, is zero gravity habitat. Um, but it really... You know, we, there's some lights and some fans in it, but other than that, it's just a passive structure to give a lot more living space that could be accommodated in the, the little dragon. When they get close to Mars, depending on the design, the, the, it's either just expended or else it's repacked and we land and then we reinflate it on the surface to give more living space there. But it only weighs a couple of hundred kilograms, so in fact, you could have two. Uh, one to use in space and a new one to put out once you're on the ground. You obviously cannot leave it inflated while you're doing re-entry. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Antonio Gomez. Uh, also on the inflatable cabin, uh, we saw a, a tremendous storm in the movie The Martian. Will this inflatable cabin uh, be strong enough or what's the probability of it being punctured? Um, thank you. None. Um, the, 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 the Martians, I like the Martian movie a lot, and it is the first movie that ever attempted to depict a Mars mission in any realistic way. But one thing in it that was not realistic at all was that storm blowing everything down. Okay, that the Martian atmosphere is only 1% as thick as Earth's atmosphere, and that means that a 100 mile an hour wind on the Martian surface is only as strong a wind as a 10 mile an hour wind on the surface of the Earth. So you would not have uh, uh, that happening. Uh, the, you know, and, and we've had landers on Mars, and none of them have experienced any problem from the wind, uh, except in some cases dust deposition, um, but not physical damage of any kind. Uh, 